Welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to be talking about pain reprocessing therapy today. Um, first question is for Tanner. Tanner, um, how did you decide to work with chronic pain patients? Yeah, um, so for myself, I think uh, like many people in kind of this like mind body community, um, like I, I probably have been in chronic pain for maybe about four years. Um, and really, you know, not much was being found in terms of physical cause. And uh, they were kind of leaning towards like a diagnosis of fibromyalgia um, and just came upon kind of in a frantic search on the internet for solutions uh, upon Dr. Sarno's work. Uh, and that was kind of my first introduction to it. Um, and at first, I think like many, I was kind of opposed to the idea. Um, but, but eventually came around to it. Um, and also at that time, I, I read, uh, Dr. Schubner's book as well, uh, which was like really helpful, um, in terms of the process and, and using some of the techniques, I think that were kind of seen in the film. Um, and yeah, like, I, I think it was, it was quite quick for me, probably over the course of three or four months, like things really, uh, turned around really quickly and, and I had been pain free and primarily pain for ever since. So I think that's in short, kind of the story that, that brought me um, to this work and, and definitely made me uh, a huge believer and supporter and just the benefit of it. Yeah. Great. Um, so Howard, as we talked about this tonight is a little bit more PRT focus. Can you talk to us about sort of what that is and how it's different from maybe some of the things we saw in the film. I think, you know, we do see some PRT um, being done in the film, but we spend a lot more time on some of the other scenes. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about that so we're all on the same page of, of this framework? Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks everyone for being here. I think, I think the filmmakers liked having more of the emotional processing work in the film because that was more exciting. <laughs> it made for better movie done. <laughs> but um, it's funny, we were talking about that because we only learned about emotional processing only a, not a long, not a long before you actually started filming. Anyway, it's another topic for another day. But um, yeah, pain reprocessing is an umbrella term that we're using now. Uh, to, to describe a variety of techniques that basically are, are what people are doing is changing their relationship to the symptoms that they have, whether the symptoms are pain or anxiety or insomnia or fatigue or whatever. It's changing their relationship to those symptoms so that they're avoiding what I would call the six F's, fearing the pain or the other symptoms, focusing on them, monitoring them all the time, fighting them, being frustrated by them, trying to figure them out endlessly and trying to fix them. And so everybody does those six F's because that's the normal human response to having symptoms that are uh, you know, unpleasant, uncomfortable, sometimes terrifying or horrible or overwhelming. And so it's pretty counterintuitive to change your relationship to them and stop fearing them and focusing on them and fighting them and being frustrated by them, et cetera, et cetera. So that, to me, that's the essence of what PRT is. And then there's a variety of techniques of how to implement it. Um, and I'll just say one more thing which is PRT basically depends for the most part on having an accurate assessment, having an accurate assessment of what the problem is, because it's hard to be less fearful or less worried or less focusing on a symptom. If you think that symptom is caused by some damage in the body that's unchangeable or incurable. If you think you have some kind of structural problem that uh, is the ongoing source of the, of the pain or other symptoms. 
So PRT depends on this two-pronged approach of accurate assessment and then changing your relationship to the symptom. That's what I would say. Yeah, no, I think that's very important. And, you know, I'd like to just stay there for a minute. Maybe Tanner, can you talk to us about how your patients get that accurate uh, assessment before they come to you? And then, you know, could you maybe also talk to us a little bit about what some of those signs are that um, this type of pain can be in, uh, brain induced? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I think especially uh, like up in Canada, it's a little challenging just because we have a lack of of physicians uh, trained in in doing this or, or specialized in this area. Um, and so, you know, when, before I kind of see people, um, of course, most people have been to see several doctors and had several tests and scans done. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, very limited findings are found, right? Uh, which, is, which is a huge sign of um, that it could be neuroplastic even coming into therapy, right? Um, and I always tell people, you know, um, like, you know, we're therapists and, and not doctors, right? And so what we're looking for when I, when I kind of do like a general assessment with people in that first session is we look for kind of like likeliness of neuroplastic symptoms, right? And so, you know, in, in the PRT model, we kind of go off of like, you know, 12 criteria um, that we're kind of looking for. And, and I'm also helping people look for evidence themselves that this makes sense, right? Uh, and that the pain is behaving more like, you know, a mind-body concern or neuroplastic pain compared to how structural pain would function. So, you know, I'm, I won't go through all 12, but like a few that we kind of look for is, you know, did the did the pain or symptom originate like during a stressful time or or life transition? Um, because I think for a lot of people, they can kind of trace it back to that, right? Um, and a lot of times, it's it's the emotional response to those events that is resulting in the physical symptoms kind of being triggered. Um, the other things we kind of look for uh, is like, did an injury take place, right? Um, and so if all of a sudden the, the symptom just came on, it could be a sign that it, that it is more neuroplastic. Or if an injury did take place, have they been told by doctors that it's long past the typical time of healing, right? Um, and I think, you know, just, just looking at the way the pain's behaving overall, like is it inconsistent? Is it not always present? Or the intensity level varies? Um, you know, are there multiple symptoms going on? Is the symptom kind of spreading or moving? Because um, all of these could be signs uh, that it would be more of kind of this neuroplastic or, or mind-body concerns happening. But I think we also look at, like, especially in therapy, um, the response to emotions, right? So, you know, is it is it triggered by stress? Um, Sometimes people have pretty glaring piece of evidence, uh, as I know I did, like where all of a sudden stress increased in, in, in a certain part of the day and the symptoms shot up, right? Or all of a sudden they were very relaxed or at ease and the symptoms went down. Um, and the other thing we look for in therapy is, you know, childhood adversity, right? Like was there, was there you know, adverse childhood experiences that, that they kind of had take place. Um, and there's just a lot of research to support that. Like I know, you know, one of the studies I was looking at, it was, it was talking, I think it was 2.7 times more likely to develop like widespread chronic pain if you've experienced like an adverse childhood event, right? Um, and then the other thing we look for uh, is like the personality traits uh, that I know lots of books kind of discuss. and. And for myself, like I, I have all of these as well, right? But perfectionism, people pleasing, conscientiousness, anxiousness, right? Because um, this causes behaviors that put the brain like on high alert um, really often, right? And, and can kind of perpetuate these symptoms. Yeah, I'm sure you're not the only one in the room or on the panel that has those. Um, Dr. Schubner, so if folks live outside of uh, where Tanner's based in, in Canada, how do they go about getting this accurate assessment that is so important? Well, um, first of all, every, every regular good doctor can examine people and tell them what they think is going on. If someone has a diagnosis 
of say fibromyalgia, that means that the doctor has ruled out other disorders like autoimmune disorders and other structural things. And so if you have that, you don't need to have a special mind-body physician because you already have had a general, you know, general routine medical evaluation, right? Same with the irritable bowel syndrome. Um, same with the vast majority of the pelvic pain syndromes. And so if, if the doctor is saying, you know, you've got X, and you know that's one of the list of the types of disorders that we treat, the mind-body type disorders. And then you go to, so that's the first step. The second step is doing what Tanner just talked about, is, is investigating your own symptoms using the checklist that we have. Uh, these are in my book. I call it the FIT criteria, functional and consistent and triggered. Tanner knows all about that. And... Uh, <laughs> And you can investigate for yourself and find those, those characteristics which rule in a neural circuit problem. Um, the problem with uh, getting a, an assessment, the, the, the problem sometimes is with neck and back pain because the, the, the regular doctors are typically saying, oh, your pain is due to this bulging disc or this degenerative disc or all those types of things. And that may be inaccurate. So in that situation, um, you really can do the same thing because if they're saying it's due to degenerative disc disease or bulging discs, well, you know the data on that. Everybody has those. People without pain have those. So you can still do, use the, the functional inconsistent and triggered criteria. If you need to see a physician, so most people will not need to see a specially trained mind-body type physician, number one. Number two, there's not enough of us to go around. Uh, number three, um, but however, you can find those people on the PPDA website, ppdassociation.org, on the tmswiki.org, and then the Pain Reprocessing Therapy Institute website, and they're keeping a list as well. Um, there are there are a couple of physicians I know who do remote consultations with people. Uh, Dr. Uh, John Strax in Chicago and Dr. David Schechter in Los Angeles. So they do remote consultations. I do not. I don't have a license to do that. Um, but I think most of the people really don't will be fine using the criteria that we outlined. Great. Um, yeah, I thought one of the things you mentioned sort of like half jokingly is that there aren't enough for us to go uh, enough of physicians to go around, but that, you know, mind body physicians, but um, that's a big problem, especially as more and more people are coming to this work. Um, I just wanted to let everyone in, in the chat know that um, this My Heart is working really hard to get our film screened at universities. Um, we screened at Johns Hopkins for the incoming uh, med students last year, the Keck School of Medicine, Emory University Pain Center. So um, we're really working hard um, to change some of that. And um, we're doing screenings like this. So if you know anyone at a school, at a medical school or a therapy school, uh, please connect us. because We'd love to um, share the film with them. Um, okay, Tanner, I know a big part of your work is somatic tracking. Um, can you tell us, you know, why it's a useful tool for people with chronic pain? And then I heard you might also be interested in, in walking the group through a somatic tracking experience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, somatic tracking is a, is definitely a, a part of, of pain reprocessing therapy and, um, similar to, to kind of, um, the question Howard answered a, a couple of questions ago, uh, like typically the, the response to pain, right? And it is the human response, right? Is there's, there's fear, frustration, anxiety, uh, despair, um, sometimes preoccupation or, or intense focus on it, right? Um, and so a, a big piece, especially early on in PRT is to change the relationship like with the pain sensation. 
And so, you know, what, what we're trying to do using somatic tracking is have people's um, fear of the pain actually reduce over time. And in doing so, um, they start to actually view the pain, what we kind of call like through like a lens of safety. So really what this is, is you're, you're viewing the pain with lightness, ease, and like curiosity and interest, um, as opposed to the, the fear and frustration that might naturally come, right? Um, and we know like using, using these techniques within kind of the, the package of like psychological techniques and PRT, uh, is really helpful in exiting people out of kind of like a pain fear cycle. And then as a result, you know, over time, the, the pain symptom can start to reduce uh, or dissipate, dissipate as the relationship with the symptom, uh, pain or otherwise, starts to change. And so, yeah, I kind of explain it. Um, it's very similar to like exposure, right? So in terms of other therapy, like we do exposure all the time, like with social anxiety, uh, we slowly expose people to social situations as they kind of feel safe. And so it's the same idea um, with, with somatic tracking is we're slowly exposing them to the pain sensation, but in a different way where they're responding to it differently. And so I can go through one now, um, you know, <laughs> As I'll kind of say uh, before I get started, you can follow along if you like, um, but you know, really somatic tracking is supposed to be meant um, for kind of like more mild to moderate symptoms, right? Because uh, we don't want to, it's, it's really hard to focus kind of through that lens of safety when the, the symptom is too high. So there's no need to follow along if, if that's where you're at today either. Um, so what I'll have everyone do if, if you're comfortable is you can, you know, Close your eyes or lower your gaze. And what I want you to start off doing is just take a few deep breaths in and out, just slowing it down. And to start off, just, you know, scan your body and notice where you're feeling these sensations right now. Notice what body part they're in, where they're kind of located. And if the sensation is localized or widespread and really, you know, just describing it a bit, right? Is it burny, tingly, pressury, stabby? Just exploring like what the sensation is doing. And I want you to focus in on it, um, but I'm careful here. I don't, I don't want you to focus in on the sensation like you're studying for a test right now. We're not criticizing it or scrutinizing it or trying to make it do anything or change. So just keep slowing down your breathing with each exhale, just kind of reducing the pressure, taking it off and just allow yourself to explore it. Almost like if there was like a, a curious little puppy in your room right now. If there was a curious puppy in your room right now, it would be toppling over things, exploring things, and just have this light and easy attitude with it. So just kind of, you know, watching the sensation and noticing what it does. Does it increase, decrease, move, or change in any way? Again, it doesn't matter too much. We're just getting some practice responding to it differently right now. And I know right now it feels like something's going on in your body, but all your muscles and tendons are healthy. And all your ligaments and nerves are perfectly intact. All that's taking place is a safe, normal, neutral sensation. It's just your brain has been misinterpreting things for a long time due to feeling in danger. But right now you're safe to just experience the sensation explore it a bit and watch it in this way. And I kind of explain it to people, it's kind of like when you're at an aquarium, because, you know, when you're at an aquarium, aquariums are pretty fascinating. There's a huge glass wall and you're able to safely, you know, kind of be detached from your sea life and just watch them in this way. And so just allowing yourself to really almost watch the sensations, kind of like sea life in the aquarium. But almost like you would, you know, like a young child would watch at an aquarium. 
in this kind of fascination, just noticing and recognizing you're safe to just watch in this way. And what do you notice taking place? Are the sensations increasing, decreasing, moving or changing? Again, whatever they're doing is completely fine. So what I want you to do is just take a few more deep breaths in and out. Just allowing yourself to feel the nice release of the exhale. And when you're ready, you can come back to the room. And that's a somatic tracking. A, a quick yeah. one. That's a somatic tracking. Yeah. How do I get my therapist to do that? Yeah. No, just kidding. Great. Um, but I wanted to, Howard, ask you Melissa's question. I don't think it's already been um, asked in the chat, which is why does my pain, my physical pain, alternate with high anxiety? <laughs> That's a great question. It's kind of like the answer is because it's like, why do you climb mountains? Because they're there. Why does the brain create one symptom versus another? And why would it alternate one versus another? The reason is, is that the brain, the danger signal the brain has incredible choice of what it can produce. So, if, you know, if I've been doing this for almost 20 years, I've seen people's brain cause burning, tingling, tingling numbness, anxiety, fatigue, depression, ringing, uh, dizziness, you know, this dry eye, burning mouth, you know, this huge panoply of symptoms. And it's, it's very typical for the brain to turn some of these neural circuits on and turn other ones off. And I've seen people where they may get pain in their stomach one day and the next day they get a headache. And the day after that, they get pain in the stomach. And the day after that, they get headache. It's amazing what the brain can do. And so when you see this, it's strong evidence that this is neuro, a neuroplastic problem. And that's great. That's perfect. That's exactly what you need to know. And the key, as Tanner was talking about, is not getting upset or frustrated or worried about what's going on. The key is to stepping back and smiling and saying, oh, I see what's going on here. This is not dangerous. This is just my brain trying to alert me or message me or scare me. Your brain can't tap you on the shoulder and say, my dear, there's something that you really need to know about or really need to take care of or really need to do. Your brain doesn't do that. It doesn't have that capacity, but it does have the capacity to give you a powerful jolt of some kind of anxiety or pain or fatigue or something. And that's what it does. Great. Um Tanner, um, so right before you did the somatic tracking, um, you said it doesn't necessarily need to be done if you're in intense pain. You know, why is it um, good for patients to reduce um, fear and pain, you know, before they enter into one of, uh, into a somatic tracking experience? Yeah, and I, you know, we kind of, it's a good question and, and we kind of talk about it is, mild to moderate, people have to kind of determine like what's kind of the level that they're able to attend to their pain and, and have feelings of like safety and, uh, and reduce the fear. Right. And, and it's very much like, um, you know, if, if any sensation is, is too intense, we have a really hard time. Right. Um, because, you know, somatic tracking, you know, you can do that even with the sensations of anxiety, right? To kind of explain it like that. But you would never want to do it when someone's in the middle of a panic attack because it, it, there's just going to be such a level of, of terror around the symptom as it's occurring. And so that's the idea, right? Is that, you know, when, when the pain's high, there's other things we can do, right? Um, sometimes just distracting ourselves or using uh, what they call like avoidant behaviors um, because, a, you know, a small amount of avoidance isn't necessarily a negative thing when the, when the sensations are really high, right? Uh, it can help us kind of settle back in. Um, and over time, the, the symptoms will come down and then, then we might have more opportunities to practice, right? Um, but it's just in that way. Or sometimes I have people even notice like 
pleasant or even neutral sensations in the body, like a different part of the body and, and exploring that and sitting with that, right? Because it, it just can help calm the brain before we go into, you know, doing somatic tracking or, you know, observing our, our pain or symptoms in this way. Awesome. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Howard, I wanted to hear a little bit about how you used, you and your colleagues used somatic tracking in the Boulder back pain study. Well, I think it's exactly what Tanner was talking about. Um, we, the Boulder back pain study had, had all the people were assessed by I want to say a really good doctor, but it was actually me, so I don't know. But anyway, I assess, <laughs> I assess all the people in that study uh, personally, but, um, and uh, 43 out of the 45 clearly did not have a problem in their back, which was pretty amazing, 90, I think it's about 95%. And the other two, actually, I wasn't 100% sure about, but I was being cautious. So they had that. And then they had Alan Gordon and or Christy Weepy, two you know incredible uh, PRT practitioners, work with them to help them lower, stop doing those six apps that I talked about, start um, being able to tolerate their symptoms a little better, be with them, separate from them, observe them, smile at them and begin to start moving their bodies in ways that previously had been uncomfortable with less fear. And when you start to move a little bit with less fear, then sometimes you can move a little bit more with less fear and a little bit more. And eventually they were helping people to kind of challenge themselves and say, go ahead, brain, I, you can give me pain, it doesn't matter. I'm not afraid of this anymore. And so, and another one of the techniques that, that they used in the study was to what, what we call lean into the sensation, to feel, allow yourself to feel the sensation as Tanner was talking about with kind of a curiosity, thinking of the sensation as an energy or a warmth or a tingling and stop, instead of calling it pain, calling it, you know, George or Fred or Sally, or just saying, Oh, this is just this is just Fred here, but it's okay. And it's talking to ourselves. Another part of this is really talking to yourself. And research has shown that one good way of talking to yourself is in the third person. It's saying, like if your name is Marion, you're saying, Marion, you're okay. Marion, you're gonna be all right. Marion, it's 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 just your brain. Marion, you know, and and I, and I often try to get people to laugh and smile. I have people, like if you're Canadian, you may not be super familiar with Southern United States accents, but where a Southern United States accent might be something like, oh, honey, you're gonna be just fine. It's okay, sweetheart. And when you're talking to yourself in that way, it's kind of funny, it's smiling, and it's super loving, it's super caring. And so compassion is a really important part of this because a lot of people with these mind-body conditions have learned not to be so compassionate to themselves. They may be compassionate to others, but sometimes they have a little bit of a hard time being compassionate to themselves. So those are some of the, some of the specific techniques that we use. I think I'm gonna have to ask you to record. Marion, you're okay. Marion, so I can <laughs> use it whenever I need it. Um, okay, lots of questions in the chat. <laughs> oh, and we are recording this, how perfect, I can just take it. Um, so we have another question about somatic tracking. Um, I know this one is from Kent, but um, so why, Tanner, why is it important for uh, us to be outcome independent when it comes to somatic tracking? Yeah, so this is a this is a good question. I think um, similar to kind of what Howard Howard's discussed um, already. Like I think you know, especially when people you know start to have chronic pain, like there's this intense like 
focus and fixing like attitude, right? Like we just want to fix it. And I find, you know, for myself and, and, and many people, like when you come to kind of this mind body work that that attitude kind of continues, right? Um, where there's just so much focus on like, you know, we, we need to fix this, right? Um, and so like a lot of times when you're starting to do somatic tracking, like most people will have an experience where they do somatic tracking and the symptom shoots down or reduces, right? Um, and then it can become so quickly about like trying to do that repetitively, right? And it just creates such a level of pressure and um, kind of like Howard talked about in terms of like criticism, like that's, that's a common thing that, that a lot of people with one body concerns struggle with, but placing too much pressure on yourself is another one. Like it, it's such a common one that, that occurs and that, that goes um, right into like recovery sometimes. And when we're placing so much pressure on like a somatic tracking, doing something in a somatic tracking, um, you know, making the pain go away. And, and there's so much pressure that you need to do this right, right? Um, and then you're even criticizing yourself that you're not doing it right. And you can see how it can, it can spiral to just your brain and your nervous system feeling in a lot of danger um, and escalating it, right? Um, and so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a common one, right? That people struggle being outcome independent and they, there's just such a level of pressure to try and fix it. Um, and kind of the paradox behind it is when you actually stop trying to fix it and you know like that gives us space to be curious and interested and really notice what's happening it takes the pressure off that's when a lot of times people will start to see some healing effects right um they're not so intensely trying to fix it all the time definitely um howard i think you know obviously prt is a really incredible tool but some patients i think we know are going to need potentially more um, so what, so if it's not working, what is it that you recommend patients, um, potentially need if it's not working and how do they find that help, that resource, whatever it is? Yeah, in general, um, you know, in general, the outline of our approach is accurate is, is neuroscience education, understanding how the brain works, accurate assessments, pain reprocessing and then other therapies. And there's lots of other therapies that can be used. Uh, in particular, the one that we primarily use, or maybe two, the one we primarily use, we're now calling emotional awareness and expression therapy, which was depicted in the film and which was developed by Mark Lumley and myself as a way of trying to take a lot of other types of emotion processing therapies, notably intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy, and make it a little easier to use. And so uh, that type of therapy is, is a way of helping people to identify and express feelings that may, they may have avoided, may have been held inside, uh, may have not been able to express. And this would include anger, sadness, grief, guilt, and moving through those, through those emotions to compassion and caring. And so there's a very simple process for doing this. I've written about it in my books. Uh, Mark Lumley and I are teaching a class in this now. We're going to be teaching more classes in this in the future to train other practitioners to do this work. Um, and there's another type of therapy, there's lots of other therapies, trauma-based therapies, but the one, the other one that I found particularly helpful is internal family systems. And this was started by Richard Schwartz a long time ago. He's a brilliant guy, a good friend, friend of mine. And uh, we've written a paper on using IFS, internal family systems for pain, he and I together with Ron Siegel. And, um, and I found that to be another type of therapy that's really helpful and really fits in well with our understanding of uh, brain-induced pain and other symptoms. Um, and so finding, finding people who do this work, um, uh, the Internal Family Systems has a, has a big website with a list of practitioners. Um, 
And in terms of emotional awareness and expression therapy, uh, that is not, not quite as easy to find, I would say. But there is good, there are other more people who do what's this, the, the offshoot of it or the, uh, the father, the mother of it, which is ISTDP, Intensive Short-Term Dynamic Psychotherapy. And there is a website called the ISTDP Institute in Washington, D.C. that has a list of those types of practitioners. Howard, I think Tanya has a great question. Um, her dad is a GP, uh, MD, and um, she's wondering how um, she can get him to understand this process. Since you educate so many um, doctors, nurses, therapists, how do you um, how do you get the disbelievers to believe? <laughs> well, uh, the first rule that I have is you don't change other people. So uh, if you think you're going to change other people, particularly if you think you're going to change your family members, I think that's probably not going to happen. On the other hand, we do train a lot of people and we've developed, there's a whole panoply of training materials now. Uh, uh, the film, This Might Hurt, is a good start and it's a great way for people to learn about this work. Um, uh, I have put together six animated videos, and you can reach those through my website. And I don't know if they're linked on the This Might Hurt. I think they might be on the This Might Hurt uh, film.com website as well. There's six short animated videos that explain pain and explain the brain. Uh, I think they're pretty good. Um, they're, in terms of training, we've, we've just developed a mobile app for training professionals and other people. It's called Ovid DX, and that's going to be available uh, in the next week or month, uh, next couple of weeks or month or so. Uh, and then there's a bunch of training courses that uh, you can access uh, the PRT training program, the training I do for physical therapists with Charlie Merrill, EAET training that I'm doing with Mark Lumley, uh, there's a, a big course we, I do with Hal Greenham. So there's a lot of training, training opportunities for people who want to learn more about this. And all of those are uh, referenced on, um, on my website, on learnyourpain.com as well. Great. Howard, um, we have another question for you. A couple of folks in the chat have asked about dysautonomia and post-viral symptoms. Um, can you talk a little bit about those and how they may or may not be related to this work? Yes, uh, we see uh, dysautonomias, post-viral syndromes, so-called chronic Lyme disease, long COVID disease, chronic EBV infection, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, there's been a whole host of ways to try to explain chronic pain on a physical basis that are not, just to be blunt, are not accurate in my view. And so, and I know it's controversial and I know a lot of people have been told and there's been a lot written about <clears throat> how these disorders are actually due to joint laxity or inflammation or chronic viral infections or things like that. And I don't have time to detail all of the information on that, but I've looked at it very, very carefully. And um, and I and we we have treated people with all those things successfully. So the other one is mast cell activation syndrome. It's another one that people are talking about a lot lately. I've seen people with that. I really don't think that that exists in the way that people are talking about it. Um, so you know there's just there's just a lot of information out there. And frankly, I, I think some of it can be very misleading and somewhat counterproductive because you, you go to some of the websites and they're telling people that this is a horrible thing that can not be cured. And they're really scaring people and fear, as we have discussed, can make things worse. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Tanner, I'd love to know if, like, what haven't I asked you? What is important um, that you want to, you know, impart to the group while we're all together um, about this work and how you do it? Yeah, like, I think, I think we've covered um, quite a bit of the aspects, right? Um, 
I know we've kind of talked about PRT um, in general, but at the end, talking about other modalities that that can be helpful. And I I know I'm excited because I'm in I'm in Howard's um, training come in June uh, for for EAT. Um, oh, oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. So that'll be that'll be very exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but I think, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of different ways to work with mind body concerns. Right. Um, and it's finding the right fit. And so, you know, um, of course there's, there's themes across, uh, the different like modalities that we use, but, uh, sometimes things click better for, for certain people. And, and I've experienced that, right. Um, with certain people and that's completely okay. And I, and I think that's uh, that's important, but it's just understanding that there, there, there's lots of support. And I you know Howard's listed lots of different resources. Like there's lots of resources out there for uh, for people now, and I think that's becoming more and more prominent. And and even compared to like I think when I was recovering, like even the app Curable wasn't a thing. Like that that didn't exist back then, right? Which I know lots of people use, and 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 it can be really effective for for so many, right? So um just that there's there's a lot of information and and uh useful things out there that can help a lot of people yeah great howard same question any final words to the group yeah i'm just answering a question that ryan answered and asked and he is the question was how to start talking to people about this and what i was saying is that you know the discussion needs to be done with love and caring and compassion it needs to be done so that people are validated and they know that their symptoms are real and that they're not fake or imaginary or they're not making them up. And then it's talking a bit about how the brain works and predictive processing and understanding that our brains actually generate all of our internal experiences. And then just exploring with an open mind um, what the characteristics of what they have looking at their life, looking at the relationship between stress and, their, and the symptoms they have, looking at the characteristics of their symptoms. Do they come? Do they go? Do they move around? All the things that we've talked about. And when you do that and you just take time, and sometimes it takes several days or weeks or months to begin to just figure it out. But if you take the time and you do it with an open mind, almost all the time it'll become very obvious what's going on and that is really the opening that people can have to begin this process of getting better. Awesome. Thank you, Howard. Um, Kent, do you want to tell everyone about the breakout rooms and lead us into that next section? Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation um, and Kent's going to tell you about our breakout rooms. Is anybody nervous? Yeah. Right. We're literally on this together because what we're here for is to get better. Tingling to numbness, primarily my left hand. 100 million Americans suffer from chronic pain. This illness has taken a lot out of me, out of my family. Just the worst pain that I've ever imagined in my life. He's taking all these meds and he's no better than he was. Millions of patients with pain have become opioid addicted. We have this idea that when there's pain, there's something wrong with the body. It's not always that simple. Hysterectomy, colostomy, ileostomy, but then the pain came back. The brain is powerful and can cause almost any symptom imaginable. How does our life events affect our body? That's what we're going to go through today. It terrifies me. I can see that. I would reject the notion that everybody with chronic pain has a psychological origin. I don't expect Dr. Schubner to cure me. I call BS. It's pretty succinct <laughs> to the point. I don't know exactly what to expect. Living in fear is the perfect prescription for back pain, migraine, headaches. People can retrain their brain, and that's what I'm asking you guys to do. I fought my whole life. Just tore my life apart. 
I'm angry and I'm sad. This treatment is not for everybody. Now I'm experiencing new symptoms, and so I'm freaking out. You're stirring things up. My shit is so stirred up. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how something you don't even know is there has that much power over you.